So welcome back for uh, this fifth and last lecture that I give here. I'm first of all very impressed that I see faces that seem to have gone through the previous two lectures which were full of maths and yet you people have come back here for more. However, today's lecture is going to be on online currencies and it's not going to be full of maths. So it's going to be a, a pleasant uh, experience for everybody involved. So the topic for today is online currencies and this is, uh, I mean, this has been in the zeitgeist in the last 20 years in the research community but it really has hit the, the news big time uh, in the last few years when everybody heard about Bitcoin. Okay, has everybody here heard about Bitcoin? Yeah, okay, good. Um, now, so you may think that this is a lecture about Bitcoin but in fact it's not. It is only half a lecture about Bitcoin, but we will go much further back to understand why Bitcoin is what Bitcoin is, okay? And how did it come to be as it is, and why is it robust enough to be able to do what it does, and what the problems are, and why are these problems there to start with? So, let's jump straight in. So, very often when one thinks about a currency, uh, they mix it up with what instead is a payment instrument, okay? And these are very different and distinct things. In fact, Stephen spent a whole lecture uh, earlier today really talking about payment instruments, okay? How do we actually transfer value from one account to the other? What are the mechanics of doing that, okay? So cash is one way of doing that. I mean, I can just open my wallet and give you some euros. Okay, so now I had some value, you have that value. Uh, traditional Venetian Flor Florence ways were letters of credit, and this is how the Medici family made its fortune in uh, the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. Okay, so they would basically have offices around Europe and they would give you a letter with some cryptogram as well to protect its integrity as it turns out and then you wouldn't have to travel around with a lot of gold or whatever because then you would be assassinated. So instead you would travel with that letter, you would turn up in their office in Amsterdam, you would show that letter to the local branch there and they would give you some money for you to trade, okay? So that was a very important instrument that started off modernity as we know it today. Other things that we have in the UK and here as well, the thing is uh, sh checks. Uh, you can also do bank transfer very easily and you can use debit cards. All of these are just payment instruments, okay? And how can you tell that they're all payment instruments? Because effectively the value you're transferring is always denominated in euros or pounds or dollars or whatever, right? I mean, it's not transferred from euros to something else and then back to euros, right? Okay. Now, each payment instrument has advantages and disadvantages, and in particular, it has a cost. In particular, the cost of handling cash is enormous, okay? Because you have to have vans with guards to be able to do so safely if you do it at big scales. You have to have cash tills. You have to have training for using them, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now, different instruments also provide very different properties when it comes to security and privacy. And in particular, the key distinction between all the electronic ones that we know so far and the old style cash we had is anonymity, okay? For cash, you can just turn up to a shop, you just give some tokens, you get the goods, no one asks you for your name. Whereas if you hear the banking system, somehow your name is always associated with the transactions. Okay, cool. Now, it turns out that cryptography has intensely been used for payments. The first part is really the traditional mainstream banking, credit cards, EMV protocols, but I'm not going to cover these because Stephen, presumably, Stephen, has covered EMV? Yes. Good. So you know all about EMV now. And there is some crypto in there to, of course, protect some parts of the transactions. The crypto is mostly not the most relevant part. Authorization turns out to be the most important part, whatever. However, there was also a research track on how to make better cryptographic payments, okay? And that research track is also quite old. For example, in 1990, David Chaum, who's quite a notorious cryptographer, 
and uh, has been around since the very beginning of public key cryptography at least, um, started a company called DigiCash. Okay, this is 1990, EMV protocols are standardized in 1993. Okay, so what is DigiCash? It's effectively a way of simulating the properties that coins have in the digital world and in particular that special property of privacy. You want the coins on one side not to be forgeable, particularly if they're digital things that you can copy around. You still want them not to be forgeable in a trivial way. However, you also want them to be spendable in a way that doesn't leave a trace of your name and what you bought everywhere you go. Okay? So, sadly, his company went bankrupt in 1998, partly due to the fact that this idea did not take up, partly due to the fact that he probably was not the best business manager in the world. Don't tell him I said that, though, because he's a vindictive man. He was a visiting professor at uh, KU Leuven as well after that adventure. But one thing that you should take about payments here is that we can actually do that. We can have digital coins as a payment mechanism that simulate cash. And the model for doing this is very simple. Alice goes to some bank type entity deposit some real money, some euros, okay? And then she gets issued with the same amount of denomination in euros in digital coins, okay? So for each euro she deposits, she gets a digital equivalent of a euro. And then she goes to a shop and she spends that money, okay? Now, conceptually, Bob, the shopkeeper, has a euro, okay? But it's in this weird digital form. Okay, and then Bob has to go back to the same bank usually and deposit it back. And then eventually he's able to withdraw an actual euro. Okay, so there is this kind of, effectively the value transfer as you expect is from Alice to Bob via the bank, but it goes through this funny little loop, okay, in order to protect privacy effectively, okay. And the property that you get out of this money is effectively that even if Bob and the bank put together everything they know, they're not able to tell that it is in fact Alice that performs the spending action, okay, which is quite magical. And it is related very much with what we saw in the previous topic, selective disclosure credentials with double spending prevention. So I could be really mean and spend a whole lecture on that, and then we'll go through all the maths and all that stuff again, but this is not a currency, this is just a payment instrument, okay? And one message that I want you to, to get out of this is that we know how to do this extremely well and extremely efficiently. Uh, I would uh, tell you to go and read the compact eCash paper from Eurocrate 2005. That's the state of the art system for how we can do extremely well. Okay? There is high authenticity, there is no double spending, there is privacy, it's all great. But this is not a currency. Everything is denominated in euros or in dollars or in whatever. Okay, it's just a way of saying these euros now go to this other account with some security properties electronically. So, what is a currency then? Right? What is a currency? We, we all take it for granted that you know, we have these euros or these pounds around, but what is it? Okay? So a currency really is a way of storing and remembering value. Okay? And uh, it is also to store it across time, okay, so that you can basically perform some job today, get some value, but not have to spend that value immediately now. So you can save and buy bread tomorrow. In particular, you can work during your lifetime and then spend when you are retired and you cannot anymore work. Very important, okay? Secondly, it's a way of storing value across transactions. Imagine I want bread and I have fish, okay? If you had fish and you wanted bread, we could just meet and I give you the fish and you know, I get the bread, or the other way around. But now if there are three goods and three people, okay, and I want the good that you, know, you have, and you want the good that he has, and he wants the good that I have, you know, there is no transaction that can happen, right? There is an inefficiency there. Either I will have to be a market maker and say, well, you know what, I will buy whatever I don't want anyway in order to resell it and then create a market, or we would be stuck. Yes? Can you check not on mute? I am not on mute. Good. <laughs> so, so that sucks, 
basically. We don't want to have to barter. In fact, David Graeber, who's a, a, um, an anthropologist, uh, says that there has been never a society that worked on barter. This idea that primitive societies used to do barter and then we invented currency is just a fiction of economist imagination. It was just a way for Adam Smith to just explain the concept of a currency. It was not actually a historical fact in no way whatsoever. Okay, barter was never it. Okay, so currencies allow us to get out of this deadlock because what we do is we have this figment of our imagination to which we ascribe value. Okay, and therefore I can sell you my fish for some raw value effectively, which is this fiat currency, and then I can use this raw value because you also accept that it has value to buy the other good, and this way we don't have to actually have inefficient barter systems, which never existed, by the way. Okay? Now, of course, you would say, it makes sense, maybe, instead of just having a figment of our imagination creating and storing value in our society, to have something that maybe has some intrinsic value, something that everybody wants. What about gold? It's shiny, it's beautiful, right? What if, you know, we all agree that we would like more gold, okay? And therefore, I buy bread, I give gold, and then, you know, you buy something else and you give gold and everybody uses gold, okay? It turns out that if you really look at the economics of the matter, this is, again, quite inefficient because suddenly we're tying in our value system with the intrinsic use people have of gold. Okay? So suddenly what would happen is the following. Either we would need more gold in our society to make gold things that are useful, such as, for example, um, telescopes need gold and scientific instruments need gold and things that we send to space need gold, like actual gold, the metal, not just to look pretty. Okay? Uh, so, if we tie these things into our value system, either they become too expensive, right, and then we can't send things to space, or we decide, okay, well, let's mine more gold then because we need to send things into space, and then we devalue our, money, our, our value system, okay, both of which are not a very good idea because they're not really related to each other, okay? So, it turns out that Instead of doing bartering, or instead of actually having a reference commodity that we use as value, it is actually more economically efficient to come up with a figment of our imagination that has no other use than actually to store value. And this is what we call a euro or a pound or a dollar these days. They're just figments of our imaginations. They're fictitious units to, that, that are ascribed with the property to store value. Good. So, what are the problems with these figments of our imagination, okay? How do we create such a system that actually works for doing exchanges and storing value? The first thing is that somehow we need to control the money supply, okay? And you can think of money as a commodity, like many others, okay? there is a particular number of units of money at any time, okay? Let's say there are a thousand coins, okay? There are a thousand units, let's say, okay? And money basically acts as a commodity, okay? People want it or don't want it in relation to other commodities because they believe more or less that it will actually store value for them for the future, okay? And there are, like in any other commodity setting, three things that can happen. Either there is an entity that can inject more money, okay, so increase the money supply, or the money supply is fixed forever, it's just a thousand coins and there will always be just a thousand coins and there will never be any more or less, or you can actually destroy coins, okay, so today there are a thousand but, you know, by some mechanism, you know, some of them will not be valid tomorrow, okay. Now, money is a commodity in that sense. So if you, in fact, have too much demand for money, okay, and not enough supply, the value of money goes up, okay? If the money of value goes up, the value of the commodities goes down, okay? And you have basically over time, and then you have deflation. That's a bad thing, deflation, for an economy, okay? Why is it bad? Because it means that if today you have 10 euros and you can buy a skirt, 
and tomorrow you have 10 euros and you can buy a nicer skirt, your incentives are not to spend the money. You're going to hoard the money to store, to use it as a store of value to see its actual value increase. Okay? And that means that, you know, instead of buying bread and fish and all these things and just using it in order to move things around that actually, you know, do your, make your economy run around, you just keep it in your pocket and wait. So that's actually a bad thing for an economy, for money to appreciate in value over time. Now, on the other side, if the demand is weaker than the supply of money, then money loses over time, then money loses its value over time. And that is called deflation. Okay? And that is also bad if you, want, if you have over you know, hyperinflation because it means that you cannot reliably anymore store value in it. If basically I, I get some coins for my fish and tomorrow I cannot get anything for these coins, well, I won't do that either, right? So that's also not a very good idea. So it turns out that there is this basically, so on the other side, you know, not generating any money turns out to be okay. But there is basically this, this tension about these things, okay? And in particular, there is a tension here because what is fairest, okay, namely not generating any new money and not destroying any money, this is actually turns out to be fairest in the sense that you, know, you don't actually tax the people who already have money or the people who don't have money, which is what happens if you have inflation or deflation. It's also not a very good idea if you want to grow your economy because your economy does benefit from a little bit of inflation, not any deflation, not hyperinflation. And this is why if you follow the news in the Eurozone, there is actually a target which is about 3%, okay, or something like that. Is it 3%? Is anyone from Ireland here? Can, how much is it? 2%, 3%? 2%. 2%. 2, okay, sorry. You know, these days, coming from Greece, it's <laughs> <laughs> 2, 3, you know. Okay. Good. So there is this idea of the money supply, namely that, you know, you can inject or, you know, remove money from circulation to, you know, accommodate how much value it has over time to different goods. But of course there is a really key question, which is who controls that? Okay, who controls that? And this is going to be very important for us because the answer traditionally is the central national bank. This is in fact the job of the central bank. The central bank does not, you know, accept deposits, okay? It actually manages the money supply, okay? But of course, when it comes to online currencies, we usually do not have a central bank to deal with this, okay? So the question then is open, who deals with this? No one? Is the, is the problem not occurring online maybe? We'll see about that. The second question is the following. If somehow, through some mysterious way, the money supply increases or decreases, okay? It means that there is new money in circulation or some money has to come out of circulation. How do we determine which money gets out of circulation, if that is the case, or to whom goes the money that goes into circulation, okay? That's a very, very important question, okay? Who's getting richer or poorer according to, you know, our online currency or not, okay? I'll tell you what happens in, uh, in the actual uh, economy. Who gets richer when money is made? Does anyone know? The banks, okay? That's the answer. The, the actual loans are extended to the banks that they are then extended to companies that then have to pay back. The difference basically is going to the banks. But that may not matter as much as you think, and we'll see that in a second. You may be very angry at this point. You're like, the banks? Let's see why this is thought to not be quite so much of a problem. So, what other problems do we have when we try to make a currency? Okay, so I've, I've already discussed the money supply. Okay, there, there are coins, goes up, goes down, that number. It's important if you think of money as a commodity like any other commodity that you use in order to keep memory. But you use money to keep memory. So if that is the value of money, to keep memory of the value of things, it has to be effective in this. 
Okay? Otherwise, no one will want it. And the key question is, how do we make sure that money does, in fact, represent memory of value? And that has two components to it, really. The first component is, how do we make sure that no one forgets that you actually generated some value and now you have some money? Component number one. And secondly, how do we make sure that tomorrow people will still value it? At some level, they will not just be like, <laughs> you got what? Monopoly money, thank you. We're not interested. Okay, so that's the second component. And then finally, if you have grand ideas of conquering the world and launching your own currency, one important question is, even if the money supply is stable and you don't have a problem of distribution down the line, how do you initially distribute these thousand coins? Okay, so let's imagine I want to make a, a currency today. How do I actually go about deciding who gets the money to start with in order to then have an economy that grows and makes me even richer? Okay, or you richer, or the country richer, whatever. Okay, so these are all the important questions. And again, Payment mechanisms have to deal with none of those, okay, because they're not currencies, and currencies have to deal with all of those because they're currencies, not just payment systems. Okay, so don't get mixed up between the two. Very different problems. Okay, so let's uh, jump straight into bad ideas that we have learned a lot from. So in the early 2000s, actually late uh, 1990s, there was Mojonation. And Mojo Nation was a peer-to-peer -peer network that had as an aim to facilitate distributed storage of data. Okay? So the idea at the time was that since uh, personal computers were everywhere and they were all connected to the internet, why would we need big services? Well, big services were not around anyway. It was not yet the era of cloud computing and Google. So why don't we use each other for storing files and for downloading blocks of files and for doing piracy at a grand scale. Okay, you may remember that it was roughly the same time that Napster had collapsed under legal troubles. So every, all of these guys were like thinking, okay, you know, can we do Napster or something like Napster, pretending that we're actually doing backups for each other, but actually let's do Napster without having a central place that can be raided by the feds and closed down, okay? That, that was very much in the zeitgeist at the time. However, if you are in a peer-to-peer -peer system, it was um, recognized and you store files for others and you're asked to serve them back, it was recognized very on that some economics really matter. In particular, you need to do some kind of accounting of value because of course clearly as a peer you are providing values to others by storing their blocks and serving the blocks, okay? And if no proper accounting is that of that value, then people would freeload. They would ask you to store lots of things, they will ask you for a lot of things, okay, and they will ne just never do anything for you. And in fact, all the incentives would be stacked for everybody to be doing this, which means that effectively no one would be doing any work for anyone else and the thing would collapse. Okay? So the idea was, can we use a currency to incentivize good behavior, okay? So the good people from Mojo Nation, um, and in fact it, uh, it included two key developers called um, Brem Cohen and Zuko, uh, who were two of the three first employees of Mojo Nation. I'll tell you more about them as we go along. So they thought, okay, could a currency help us here? A currency is, as a, its job is to store value, so it makes sense to have a currency. And they invented the Mojo, which was the currency of Mojo Nation. And it was so central to their idea that they called the place Mojo Nation. And what is the idea of the Mojo? The, the idea is that every time you're actually interacting with a client, so as a peer, you can either act as a client or as a server, you can be both, okay? But when you interact as, uh, sorry, as a server, you can request for any interaction a certain payment. Anything you do can be associated with a request for payment. Okay? And then you will only execute that action if indeed the other side agrees to provide that payment and then you do something for them. That something could be store a block or retrieve a block or even say hello, as it turns out. Okay? So the first problem, of course, they had is that, okay, you are a peer in there, you act as a server, how do you know how much to ask for? Right? I mean, 
Is one mojo good? Is two good? What, what do you think? How many would you ask for? As much as you can. But, you know, it, it's difficult to tell, right? So the first thing they did is they introduced a market mechanism on the server end of the protocol. Okay, so the idea was that you know that you have some spare capacity, some spare disk space or cycles or whatever that you, you're happy to put out for sale effectively. Okay, and then you get a queue of requests. Each request is associated with some payment that the client is happy to do and you reorder them effectively according to that payment and you effectively just prioritize the ones that pay you most. It's a market mechanism, okay? It's just a market mechanism. It's a second uh, price auction, which means that you don't charge the highest one at the highest price. You actually find the closing price and charge all the ones that are within your capacity at the closing price. This provides a stability. It's a vicary auction mechanism. It's incentives compatible. No one has incentives to lie. And you know, economics is beautiful in that sense. They give you all these theorems. So now, on the other side, you had clients, and what do the clients, how do the clients decide what to do? They basically say, okay, I'm about to do an action, I'm happy to pay that much for that particular action. Okay. So, theory was beautiful, and the hope was, what was the hope? The hope was that the, the money will act as a control loop, effectively. Okay? So, as your as you're overutilized, you would basically increase your prices to reduce the um, utilization, uh, and then clients would have to pay more to utilize you at the optimal level, and clients could not freeload because they would not actually have enough money. And then, by uh, 2002, the service experienced an economic meltdown. Actually, it's, it's a beautiful economic failure, even though it is quite controversial that it is really an economic failure. I think that by now we really have a good idea that it was a pretty much a purely economic failure that happened. Let's look a little bit at what went on. So, uh, Jim uh, McCoy was actually the CEO of Mojo Nation, and he says, for core messaging protocols, some clever users figured out that they could steal everyone else's credit by setting an outrageously high price for responding to just this hello message. Okay? So in order to talk to someone, you know, you needed to pay already. And some people said, well, you know, if for you to talk to me, you have to pay to start with. And then the, the interesting part in Orange starts, he continues saying, responding to this problem required us, this is the Mojo Nation, developers and service operators to hand out more credits to existing users. Okay? So there was a little bit of a mud fight on a mailing list. This is where I took out this, uh, these quotes from. And uh, on the other side, Daniel Nagy concludes something that is quite compatible with this, that first, Mojo Nation uh, allowed some unbacked currency, so it's not backed by gold or by some work or anything like that. And then they just handed it out without actually requiring users to do anything to get it. Okay? Then the prices started to go up, okay? because there was basically a lot of supply of money okay, in comparison with the supply of goods. Okay? And the and they did not feel, the operators did not actually feel any pressure to reduce their prices because there was an oversupply of money coming in. Okay? So that is leading to a market collapse that was meant to do this feedback loop. Okay? Suddenly, precisely as described above by Jim, this is the original quote, the operators found a system with an insaluable thirst for mojo. So people wanted more and more mojo in order to be able to use the service at all, to even say hello to client, to, to servers, okay? And then they had to keep pumping more money into the system to allow people to even talk to each other, okay? And he's, he concludes it's a classic case of runaway hyperinflation. So what happens here, right? According to what we discussed, a, a currency and a monetary system is about, okay? First of all, there is this uncontrolled creation. Well, it is controlled, but it is just crazy creation of new money. Okay, so there is this printing press of money running that creates this oversupply of, 
of uh, currency. Then it, there is this kind of unprincipled distribution, so they just kept giving money to clients so that they can uh, continue working. Okay? And then, of course, as a result of that, the, mar the market collapses. Okay? It's not the case, if, if you look carefully, that you know, the market collapsed and then you know, there was hyperinflation. It's more like they kept pumping, the market collapses, and then the service just is doomed. Okay? That was the end of it. So that was quite a ride at the time. And uh, people were actually a bit worried about exactly what's going on and whether there is actually a future in, in those kind of currency-based peer-to-peer systems. You know, it seemed like actually a central bank and good governance is absolutely necessary to avoid this. And as an aside, which we will not discuss at great length because there is no crypto, decentralized, no interesting computer security element into it. This phenomenon has also happened in a number of online games that have also some integrated uh, system within them to you know, buy goods, flaming swords, you know, killing monsters gives you gold, and then you can buy swords and sell them on eBay, etc. And many of them have actually collapsed under very similar situations. To play the game and have fun, users need to have some money, but users don't have any way of making money to start with in the game, so they are given some money to start with. Second Life is an example of this. So when you get an account, you get some money to start with. But then, you know, it's not very fun to continue playing the game if you run out of money, so every week they were giving people money. And right now there is basically the situation where the actual assets they have does not anymore back their currency and everybody's waiting for them to collapse. This is in the case of Second Life. Other games have already collapsed under that and what they do is basically instead of hiring economists to deal with that problem, they just reboot the world every six months when you know, things start going crazy. <laughs> they just reboot it. If only we could do the same thing for Europe, that'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> We're about to, I think, when everybody goes bankrupt. So, in any case, so this is not a, a unique problem here to just their system. And in fact, it is not even because it was totally decentralized that this failure happened. In fact, the money supply was centralized and it was very poorly managed indeed. Okay. However, as I mentioned, two of the first developers were Zuko, uh, who is famous for Zuko's triangle uh, about naming. Uh, but the other one is Bram Cohen. And Bram is famous for something else. So in 2001, and while uh, you know, Mojo Nation was in its deathbed, effectively, Mojo Nation as a company closed down in 2003. The project continued as a free software project until 2005, and then it just died out a little bit. So Bram Cohen, while uh, he was seeing Mojo Nation go down, was busy designing this other protocol that is now known as BitTorrent. Okay? BitTorrent is a great success in comparison with Mojo Nation. And uh, in fact, it is a not insignificant fraction of the backbone traffic currently. Okay? And Zuko in 2005 reflects on Bram's design of BitTorrent and he says that in fact, several of the ideas from BitTorrent that, that went into BitTorrent were just a deep understanding and a radical simplification of the monetary system in Mojo Nation. In particular, he says, one can think of the mechanisms implemented in BitTorrent as just time-limited, file-specific, non-transferable accounting. Okay, who knows how BitTorrent works? One hand, anyone else? Okay, good. Who knows what BitTorrent is? Okay, good, 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 we're, we're on. So BitTorrent is a way to exchange big files in a peer-to-peer -peer way, okay? Usually, and this is really the killer app, it is associated with pirating massive movies. And there is a reason for that, okay? But there is also legitimate content such as downloading Linux distributions or whatever else, okay? So how does it work? The idea, at least in the very traditional old-style BitTorrent, I'm not going to talk about the latest BitTorrent, like in 2002, what was the idea? You have effectively a tracker that keeps track of who is interested in a file. 
So let's say we're all interested in downloading the movies associated with SecApp Dev. Yeah? So we all immediately go to our BitTorrent, we follow the tracker that keeps track of who cares about SecApp Dev, and we're like, OK, great, you know, where is the, where's the stuff? OK, we want it. Then Joan joins with the movies, OK? And he's called the Cedar, because up to that point, there is no one with the goods in the room. So he joins with the, the movies that he just has edited. Okay? And now he's seeding, and he's seeding because he's not really asking for anything. He's quite, he's quite altruistic in giving without actually requiring anything himself. Okay? And then what happens is some of us will connect to him and request some of the blocks. Okay? And because he doesn't need anything in life from us, he, he already has all the blocks of all these movies, he just made them, he will just give us blocks at some rate, at some low rate even. Okay? But it would be super inefficient if all of us just swamp him and he had to basically give us all the blocks and all the movies. It would be no better than him just running a web server and just serving the movies. Okay? But BitTorrent does something slightly more clever. Because we all know that we each other have an interest in these movies, we can also connect to each other and request blocks from each other. Okay? So suddenly it is not just all of us going to one person and downloading everything, it is also going to each other and downloading things. However, how do you av avoid freeloaders? What if I just, you know, go to everybody and say, could you please give me blocks, give me blocks, give me blocks, and actually never help by providing blocks back to anyone else? That's antisocial behavior, and you want to incentivize against it. This is what Mojo was for. Okay? So Bram, instead of actually having a full-blown currency, said the following. We'll be optimistic about it. We will just provide a block and wait for another block. When we get another block from a peer, so we, we create a link between two peers, provide a block, get a block. When we get a block, we provide another block. When we get a block back again, we provide another block. And that implements a tit-for-tat strategy, which means that if you're not behaving according to the protocol and you don't ever provide back blocks when you're asked to provide back blocks, you will just get some blocks, but the rate at which you receive information is going to be very low. Okay? Is that clear? That there are good reasons for you to provide blocks because this way other people will provide blocks at a higher rate. Good. Now, is that a currency? Not so much. It doesn't really store value very far. So, it is a currency insofar as you store value by providing a block to your communication partner for the duration of that torrent. Once we download the file, both of us will just go away and we'll never remember that we helped each other. And only for that torrent. Okay, so it's limited in time because once we do the business, we're done. We cannot store for our, you know, I cannot just give you a lot of movies now and then get some more in a year's time. No. Um, and we also don't store them across torrents. So, you know, if, we, if I provide you a lot of blocks about one movie, but I'm actually interested in another movie, there is no way of actually storing the value across those two exchanges. We both have to care about exactly the same material. And what incentives does that create? It creates incentives for actually sharing big files or aggregates of files. So very often you will see torrents that are not just about the latest episode of a series, but that package together all the episodes of all the series ever. The whole of Doctor Who, okay, which is like gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes. Why is that? Because that in itself allows you to transfer value across a much wider array of goods so that maybe if you have the latest uh, episode of Doctor Who, you can exchange it for an older episode of Doctor Who. If the torrent was just the latest episode of Doctor Who and you already had it, you'd have no reason to actually participate in that. So far, so good. So BitTorrent, super great success, was influenced deeply and very directly by Mojo Nation, but it succeeds without a currency. Okay? It doesn't succeed in making a currency, it succeeds by not making a currency. So let's go back to some theory. So we already uh, have seen that one of the reasons, one of the reasons uh, Mojo Nation failed was because they were making money and giving the money away. 
Okay, and then the original question comes back, which is, well, okay, fine, you know, how, do you, how should you distribute money, even to start with? Okay, how do, you, how do you do this? Let's say you rule with majesty over this room, okay, and we don't have a monetary system, let's say, and we want to start a monetary system. Who starts off with the money? Okay. Now, to me, for years, this was a very important question and I was super surprised that no one, was, no one seemed to be dealing with this question from an economic perspective. Um, and I always found that super, super bizarre. And then I discovered that it is because there is a very famous theorem called Cozy's theorem, okay, that economists, particularly uh, classical, you know, uh, free market economists, really, really, really appreciate. And Cozy was a Nobel laureate in uh, economics in 1991, I believe, I think. Yes, yes. And his theorem says the following, that if you have any economic system, okay, and the transaction costs are zero, so we can basically make contracts and transact at no cost, no cost. And we can basically make contracts about everything. Your windmill is putting shadow over my chicken pen and as a result they are stressed and they make less eggs. I tell you what, I'll pay you some money, you pay me some money to deal with it at zero cost. For the actual, for the actual contract drafting, the, cost, the, the value is just after that on what we agreed. Like weird stuff, we can make contracts about everything. So he says that if indeed we live in a world like that, it doesn't matter how we allocate property to start with, okay? The outcome will be economically efficient, okay? And this is really the, the key here. The outcome will be economically efficient. So as a result, from a microeconomist perspective at least, the initial allocation is irrelevant, okay? Like you, you give people stuff, like ra radio frequencies. Actually, Cozy developed this theory as part of trying to allocate spectrum frequencies, which is, from an engineering point of view is very interesting as well. And the states were asking themselves, how do we allocate frequencies so that there is no interference and all that stuff? And he said, as long as you basically have very clear property rights of who has what frequency, just give them out at random, people will make contracts amongst each other and the frequencies will end up in the hands of those who would benefit most from having the frequencies. How will that happen? If I have a big radio station with lots of backers and lots of advertisers, and you happen to have the frequency that interferes with mine, I will pay you off some amount from my great advertising revenue for you to go quiet. Okay, therefore it will be an economically efficient allocation. You will still you will stay quiet, I will buy your frequency, let's say, and you know, I will still basically, since I, have the, I am the one who generates most value out of having that frequency, end up with the frequency in my hands. It doesn't really matter how we get there, that's, you know, at the limit, it will all be fine. However, this is a deeply, deeply misunderstood theorem when it comes to online currencies and generally even. And the misunderstanding is what efficient means for an economist, particularly a microeconomist. Many people, particularly geeks, think that efficient means the same. No matter how I allocate resources, the result will be the same. This is not at all what the theorem actually says. In particular, the theorem just says that whoever generates most of the value in the world will end up also having the store of the value that corresponds to them. So for example, let's go back to our, you know, our case where I rule with majesty and I'm thinking how to allocate the money. If I give you all the money, okay, and as a result you are the only one who can buy a chicken farm and feed yourself, we will all die of hunger. And this is an economically efficient allocation of resources. Because indeed, at the limit, you will have all the value, the chicken farm, and all the money. Perfect. Like e economically speaking, this is, there is no problem with that. Okay? You may even be more productive than all of us having chickens. Right? You may also, of course, be less productive overall. But microeconomists are not really concerned with aggregate measures of wealth. 
they care about you know, what is the relative incentives of different parties in taking part in transactions. Okay? So it may be the case that you do end up with an economically efficient allocation that as an aggregate makes your economy worth zero. Okay? So that's a serious problem with taking that approach that ah, it doesn't really matter who gets the initial money. It will all work out at the end. First of all, it work, works out for the individuals because whoever gets most money at the beginning will be probably better off to, to, you know, at the end okay? because they will also use it to buy productive capacity, not just distributed around. And secondly, from a macroeconomic perspective, it does not guarantee that it maximizes your, the size of your economy. Okay, so very important problem, very understudied in some respects in economics. We don't really have much to rest on to actually solve that problem as engineers. Like, you know, if you go to your economics department and you turn around and you say, can someone help me out? Either you will find someone who tells you it's trivial, Cozy's theorem, or you will find some welfare economist who will tell you about hunger in, in, in India, but won't automatically know how to actually engineer the market mechanism to, to deal with that. Now, okay, so let's say allocating the initial money is difficult. What about new money or money that has to be destroyed? How should we do that? Okay? So there are many options. The first option is to give or delete money from people who already have money. Okay? But if you think about it, this is unfair to either the older generations who are using the money to store value for, you know, their older days, or to the people who are effectively taking part, took part in some exchange and now are going to do something else because effectively you are taxing them. Okay? On the other side, you're not taxing those who hold capital, for example, and that you're not taxing those who are, let's say, young and are working to get the money. Okay? So that's not very fair. I mean, it could be fair in some respects, but not automatically fair. Another option is to actually not tax those who have money, but those who do not have money, to tax work. And you'd be like, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about? But effectively, this is what, what we're doing, right? I mean, we are taxing productive activity. Okay, so that's an option. And that also has a problem, right? Which is that you disincentivize work. I mean, this is a, a well-known economic problem that politicians talk about all the time. The more you tax work, the, the less people have a reason to go and work. So it's not super fair as well, because if instead you just have money and it sits on the bank and you eat from it, you know, you're cool. Okay, so you're not being touched by that. And the third option is you give or delete money at random or uni uniformly. Okay? And it turns out again from an economic perspective, this is optimal. If you, you know, if you decide to add money or remove money, which already economists are a bit feel like a bit of taboo about that, doing it uniformly across your population is good. Okay? Now, all of those have their problems, but from our perspective, this last one is particularly hard, okay? as well as the second one is hard. Because if you have an online currency, who is the constituency that you will either give or remove money from uniformly? Is it everybody who, who's a user of your system? Well, no, those are effectively the ones who, who have money. That would be option one. Is it everybody in the world? Well, that seems a bit abnormal. Is it everybody in the world and their botnets? Okay, how do you even know how many people are in your system if you're in an online setting with no strong identification? You don't even know if the accounts you have are indeed people or if they're just fake accounts that have just heard that you're about to start distributing money in an equal way and therefore decided that it would be better for them if they're equal a thousand times rather than a single time. Yeah? So that is a huge problem for an online system. How do you avoid the Sybil attack effectively, which is the attack by which one individual pretends to be a thousand in order to get some economic benefit? Okay, the opposite is also true. If you decide to delete uniformly, then people will pretend, conglomerates of people will pretend to just be one person, to only have a tiny little amount deleted from all of them, 
rather than have a tiny little amount from a thousand of them. And how do you avoid that? Again, it's not really clear. You end up having a shadow economy effectively being represented just by one account. So these are specifically hard for online currencies. And then, of course, as I said, a currency is about guaranteeing memory of value. And how do you start off the fact that people trust that memory and trust that that memory will be honored the next year or during the next transaction that they're about to do? OK? So from an economics perspective, the only thing you need is a high integrity, high authenticity, append-only log. And this is actually a very funny beast, because this is also what most cryptographic, modern cryptographic protocols also require. A high integrity, high authenticity, append-only log. Okay, you, if you read pure crypto papers, they all assume this thing exists. But in fact, building this thing is super, super hard. Building this thing in a robust way, in an economic way, in a high availability way. Okay? So that's the, the first aspect. The second aspect is how do you know that, okay, we write things in this append-only log, but when we look at them tomorrow, when you look at them with someone else, they will actually recognize that you actually have some value and they should give you their fish for it. Okay? So it turns out that this append-only log problem is at the source of our civilization. Not just a side thing that cryptographers are trying to build, it is a foundational piece of the Western and, I think, human civilization as a whole. This is an accounting mechanism from old Mesopotamia. What are we seeing here? So these things are tokens, okay, representing different amounts of crop or sheep or whatever that either are due or have been collected by someone, okay? This bigger one is a big chunk of grain, the little ones are smaller chunks of grain. And then archaeologists keep finding those things and of course it's handy to put them all in a little bit of a wallet, okay, to, to not lose them. Remember memory is all about not losing track, okay? So then they basically encapsulate those little things in these clay balls, effectively, okay? And they just keep them in there. These things are hollow, and you go clunk, 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 you can hear them. But of course, the problem with clay is that you can't see what's inside, okay? So what they ended up doing is giving those things a slightly different shape. This is 3,300 BC, and huh? this is before writing exists, huh? I, I would like to point that out. So what they do is they basically take those things and imprint them on the, on the clay before it actually gets hard. And you can see that there are three of those here and three kind of roundish shallow holes. And there are three smaller little cone type things. And there are indeed three little cone holes. And there is a big cone hole, which is this thing. Okay? And if you open this clay bowl, you find inside the actual tokens. Okay? So this system was the way they had to maintain memory about their accounts in order to bootstrap, as part of their accounting, their currencies as well, okay? of who owns whom. And there, archaeologists have found thousands and thousands of those things in dumps under the palaces of Mesopotamia. Okay? And in fact, these things existed before writing exists. And archaeologists currently believe that it is, in fact, from that that writing has evolved. Okay? As a more efficient of keeping track of value, people thought, well, instead of actually having the tokens and the clay envelope, which was a, a form of double entry bookkeeping, we'll just have the clay envelope with a seal. Okay? And then instead of having clay envelopes with just holes, we will actually discover more efficient ways of encoding information about the fact that, you know, I have 10 horses and that much grain and all that stuff, and then we will effectively provide a seal on top of that so that it cannot be faked, and this is how it evolved. However, this already provides all the tensions that we see even today in how do we maintain memory. There are really two ways of doing it. 
The first one is centralization. We have these clay tablets. We put them at the bottom of a palace. Okay, and this way we're sure that no one destroys them unless they burn the whole palace down, which has happened many times in human history, that people burn the palace specifically to destroy the accounts, specifically to go back to zero accounting and forget that memory of who has what value and who owes to whom. Okay? And there are economies of scale, of course, in having people making these things, and it is high integrity, but it is vulnerable to centralization. If the king owes you too much money and they have their hand on this, they will destroy it so that they never give you the money. Okay? So it's a problem having centralized memories of these things because whoever is around that center and controls that center controls who owes what to whom. And the second way is this decentralized way, namely having tokens that are in people's hands. However, again, there are problems with this, namely that I mean, the, the nice thing is that it's high availability, right? I mean, no one can easily destroy them, and you have them with you when you do transactions. So we don't have to all the time go with our, with our goats to the palace in order to, to write down who owes what to whom. Okay, we can just do the transaction wherever we are. They're difficult to destroy, but of course, how, how do we avoid forgeries? And that's a pure security problem, right? I mean, how do we avoid forgeries? Okay, so that's how do we maintain memory that's going to be a problem in our systems in the same way as it was a problem for these guys. Even though we're not using clay anymore, we're using something much more ephemeral. Because we found these things thousands of years after, 5,000 years after, and a few hundred years on top. Okay? I don't know if our hard disks are going to be found in the dumps of our palaces or our data centers. It's not quite clear that they will still have data on them. And then the second question is, how do you make sure that even if there is this memory there, it is worth anything? And there are really two theories about this. And I am a believer of something in the middle. So you want to ensure that people want money now, they, they see its value now, because people will want money tomorrow. And if you have that, you have a currency. If you have a write-only, append-only, high-integrity, high-availability log, and you have that faith in people, you have a currency tomorrow. If we, if we can go to the pub and do that tonight, you will end up with controlling your own currency. But how do you pull that off? Okay, how do you do that? So one way to do that is if you, you are the majestic overlord of this land, okay, and you basically say, from now on, the only thing that I will interact with in terms of value is this money. And you can do that in a couple of different ways, quite a few different ways, right? I mean, you have the monopoly of violence and you beat people up in order to make those ways work. That's very important to be able to beat people up, either through your courts or through your army or whatever, but you need to have that. So the first way is to basically through coercion. You say, the courts are mine and I force you to accept that money as legal tender. If someone comes to your shop and presents you that stuff and says, I want this dress, you must accept it. Otherwise, I will use my monopoly of violence through my courts and put you in jail. Simple. This is the case in our countries today. If someone goes to a shop and shows you a, a euro, you have to accept it. You cannot just be like, eh, I'm not so sure today I accept euros. You have to accept it. Okay, so this is not crazy. Huh? You will go to court, they will put you in jail, they will use their monopoly of violence on you. Good. Secondly, taxation. Try playing the following game with the Belgian or whichever tax authorities you are. I'm pretty sure it will be the same no matter where you are. You say, look, I am a security professional and therefore I basically generate value through my work as a security professional. Now you tell me, state, that you want 40% of that value, therefore I owe you 40% of my time in doing security development. 60%. 60, well done. Even better. So you say the following, here is a letter from me saying that you're welcome to give me, I don't know, 60% of hours as my, for me to pay my taxes. Will they accept the taxes in kind? No. They will not. They will say, what are you talking about? Give us money. Money. Okay? And this is how you make sure that everybody wants money because all the taxation has to be paid by mo in money. It doesn't matter if you use a barter system or whatever. Okay? It doesn't matter how you actually exchange value yourself. 
what matters is that you're going to be taxed in money, therefore you will want money. Okay? And this is a way of actually bootstrapping the need for money. The final way is, of course, for the payments from the state, particularly to the army and everybody else that works for the state, to be in money, not in kind or anything like that. And again, not all states had that. Well, not all jurisdictions had that. For example, in the Middle Ages, taxes were levied by serfs, from serfs in kind and were put basically in kind into the dungeon of the, the senior that was running this stuff. And then they were actually distributing to their cronies the, the wheat. Okay? And they didn't really have a very strong monetary system as a result. Later, they discovered that it's better to have a monetary system if you want to run a big economy. So, as a result of playing those three tricks, you make sure that today everybody wants money and they believe that if tomorrow you're still the master, people will still want money tomorrow and that bootstraps the process. Okay? Now, there are some people who say that there is no bootstrapping the process. This is the only thing that gives money its value. It's this game of coercion by the state. I mean, everybody's better off. It's more efficient at the end, but that's all it is. There are some people who say, well, actually, no, you don't even need bootstrapping. It's such a good idea that you know, people would naturally come up with it. However, what I think is more likely, and this is my personal opinion, is that this process is bootstrapped through some mechanisms, and then eventually money becomes money, and yes, you know, we don't need any coercion to now exchange value using money, because what else would we do, right? I mean, we would exchange fish or gold, I mean, no. If, if money is the thing that has recognized value, people will use it. But some people say, no, this is it, this is just it. People just see how valuable it is, and automatically go and use it without it. You don't need all that. That's the pure exchange theory of money. And I don't subscribe in it to either of them. However, I do recommend debt the first 5,000 years because it talks about a lot of that stuff from an anthropological point of view. One may conclude from all this that centralized power is absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary. All right? It's necessary to manage the money supply. The supplier needs to have credibility and legitimacy not to abuse the supply, while a state may actually be in a good position to do that because they are democratic, legitimate, whatever. Um, you need to manage the initial allocation. Well, how do you manage that? Again, democratically sounds to be, and centrally seems to be the only way. Uh, you need to create a constituency. So a state already has a constituency. It has citizens, usually. You know who's in and who's out. Okay? And you know that everybody born has a stake in it. And you know, if you're born outside, you don't. It seems that a state is in a really good position to bootstrap through coercion. It has an army, it has courts, not shy to use them. And then you also need to maintain a ledger that is not destroyed and that is actually high integrity. And again, having an army and a police force to protect it seems like an all right idea, right? I mean, how else would you do it? So how could you perform all these functions without a centralized entity that basically looks like a state and that has monopoly of violence is, is really the question. However, centralization is not always good. And here is a case study of e-gold. Some of you, who has heard of e-gold before? Okay. Good, good. So, e-gold is again quite an old system. It was established in 1996, two years before PayPal. Okay? Three years after EMV, six years after DigiCash. Let's keep dates in mind because they have a point here. By uh, 2002, it had one million accounts, so it was not a small system. It was not Facebook, but it was not a small system. The internet was a smaller place as well at the time. And what it provided was a very simple idea, and it was not very crypto-like as an idea. It said, you know, there is a central ledger of who has what value, and the value is actually backed by gold. So it was not even a very interesting currency. It was a currency that was not even a fiat currency. It was backed by gold. Therefore, all these problems of why does it have value or not kind of go away. Gold has value, some intrinsic value and some market value. Fine. And it also had this, and that was a great commercial strength, a network of international resellers where you could go, buy some e-gold, wire it internationally somewhere else, do payments online, and also redeem e-gold into not gold, but local currency. The gold was kept in the e-gold safes. But you were buying a chunk and selling a chunk. Fine. Now, the problem with e-gold is that it really became a crime magnet. Okay, so all the criminals loved it. 
in the same way as they love Western Union, because they could actually move money around across international borders, not within the mainstream banking system, okay, and in a way that was difficult for them to be identified. They had an online account that was very weakly identified, and then they could go to local resellers, put money in, take money out. Okay? Now, for a while, there was a bit of tension and a little bit of an ease about it. But then, as soon as the planes hit the World War uh, Trade Center in New York, things got a bit tough because new legislation passed, and that was very shortly after the terrorist attacks in 2001, that says that if you are uh, I think it's called a money transmitter in the US term, namely if you allow transnational flows of money, then you need a, a permit. But of course, e-gold was in this weird state. It was not actually transmitting money. It was not transmitting dollars. It was actually transmitting something backed in gold. It was weird. So for many years, for about five to six years, they were in conversations with the Department of Trade, the Department of Justice, about exactly if this applies to them, and they were told, don't worry, it doesn't apply to you, until in 2006, they were told, actually, it does. Any value transmission does. And in fact, in 2010, that was clarified in, in things that even include Airbnb as a value transmitter in some cases. So what happened in 2008? Finally, uh, a lawsuit hits the directors of eGold. Okay, 2008. Eight. They plea bargain. They accept the charges that of money laundering and of operating without a license. They are given small sentences, small fines, suspended jail sentences. The judge says that, well, we're really sorry, we have to actually slap you on the wrist because we know you did not intend to do anything illegal. You just intended to run a business. But, you know, your business did facilitate a lot of bad things happening, okay? And eGold is dead. They tried to actually get a license, but since they're all felons, they can't get a license anymore. Okay? That's it. So eGold is dead. They can't even sell the place, as I understand now. But what did we learn who were observing all this? What we learned is the following. We relearned in the space of currency the lesson we had learned with Napster when it comes to file sharing. Centralization brings ultimately fragility because if you have a centralized entity with named individuals even being able to take decisions and sign decisions and do things, these are, in terms of availability, the weakest links in the chain. Okay? 2008. So a centralized solution does not seem very attractive anymore, right? Despite the fact that it has some obvious qualities to deal with all the problems that we discussed so far, with Mojo Nation and generally the fundamental problems that a currency has to deal with. So, now, what everybody was here for, presumably. Um, and then comes Bitcoin, and Bitcoin comes at the end of October 2008 in a paper that was sent anonymously to a mailing list. Okay? So, and again, I want to point out that these are not just coincidences. Okay? It is the one thing influencing the other. It is people seeing e-gold and these currencies being attacked legally that really informed both the technical underpinning of how Bitcoin works, which we will see shortly, but also how it was actually presented. The people behind Bitcoin clearly had a concern about being identified, which cannot be totally unrelated with the people from eGold nearly going to jail for proposing an online currency. Okay? So the, the paper describing the idea was posted anonymously to a mailing list. Then code uh, was uh, posted about a year later in 2009 for operating effectively a peer-to-peer -peer currency. The designer or designers tried to use the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto and disappeared in 20, mid-2010 and 2010. Okay, I've never heard of these or this person since. That person or these people are estimated to have generated at the beginning of Bitcoin in totally legit and uh, over-the-board ways, because they were the first ones to be adopters of the system, that we will see how it works, about one million Bitcoins. Currently, we will see how many there are in circulation. That's a nice amount. That's a nice amount. I think they, 
they've made it if indeed you know they hold on to it and sell it now. So in the original email, uh, let's call the designer or designer Satoshi from now on as a shorthand. We have no idea if it is one person, many people, or whatever, but let's respect their wish. So Satoshi writes, double spending is prevented with a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, cool. We want to prevent forgery, so that's one idea. No mint or other trusted parties. Ooh, no centralized authority. And no mint. Well, how do we come up with coins then? Right? I mean, so that's a key question. Participants can be anonymous. Whoa, that is the thing that landed the other people in jail a few months before that. Huh? Uh, new coins are made from hash cash style proof of work. Okay, so it seems that there is some crypto stuff going on here. And the proof of work for new coin generation also powers the network to prevent double spending. Okay, that becomes weird now and we really have to go a little bit deeper to understand what on earth is happening. So, in Bitcoin, there is a concept called the blockchain. Okay, what is the blockchain? The blockchain basically is uh, a record or a ledger of all transactions that have happened so far in such a way that if you know the very last block, you're able to actually authenticate that all the previous transactions are indeed correct. Okay, so you only need to keep the head block to be able to make sure that no matter which other blocks or which chains of blocks you're presented with, you know that it is actually within the blockchain and it is indeed a valid transaction that you accept as valid. Okay? What information does each block in the blockchain contain? It contains a version, which is boring, contains a hash of a previous block. This is a cryptographic hash. Because of the properties of the hash, once you have it, you cannot anymore make up previous blocks. It also contains a hash of some transactions that happened during the last 10 minutes, usually. Okay? Um, Oh, I have many times transactions hash and all that stuff. That's just one time. And it also contains some timestamps. OK. Uh, and it also contains some nonsense and difficulty targets. I wonder why this has not gone in the other block. It also contains a big random number. Not so big. Some random number. OK. So basically, the blockchain keeps the memory. OK, remember, memory is needed. Clay tablets, whatever. That's what keeps the memory. OK. If you know the final block, that guarantees that any memory that you are presented can either be a good memory or a bad memory. Okay? And that basically allows you to, to do that. The blocks are small. They're distributed across a big peer-to-peer -peer network. You have to convince lots of people that what they remember is wrong in order to fake a memory of a transaction that took place. And that, in theory, is not feasible unless you control the, already the whole network, at which point you can just have your own currency. There is no point in uh, forking things. Okay. Now, here is the trick here. The longest chain, by convention, is recognized as being the authoritative chain. This is very important. It's subtle, and we'll see why. So if you have a chain that is full of valid blocks of length 10 and one of length 20, the one that is the correct state of the world is the one with length 20. That's the convention. And it's encoded in every Bitcoin client in the world. Now. These chains contain transactions, okay? And effectively, if I want to go and buy something from you, I will create a transaction to give you some value in Bitcoins. And what does a transaction contain? It contains some inputs and some outputs. These are called addresses. There is an input address, which basically says, go back to the blockchain, find out how much money is in this address, and bring all that Bitcoin money into that transaction. And then there are bit there are output addresses, which are basically uh, links to where the money is going to. Okay? And there are at least usually two output addresses, because one of them is to actually pay someone, and one of them comes back to the payer as change. Because you cannot split the coins that come in, let's say I have two coins or three coins, and that's three bitcoins, but actually what I'm buying is just 2.5. What I will do here is I will make an output go at 2.5 to whoever I'm paying and a 0 0.5 output coming back to me. Sometimes the two do not add up and there is some change remaining that has not been claimed back by either of the, the two usually output addresses. And that contributes to the mining process as we will see in a bit, but we'll see that in a second, okay? So bitcoins are effectively transferred between these addresses. Addresses come in with all the money that is registered under them, and the money goes out, in particular, 
splits into addresses coming out. Okay? What are those addresses? They are basically just hash, hashes of public keys that allow you, these are signature keys, okay, verification keys, sorry. Okay? The signature keys of all the input transactions are used to actually sign the transaction. So for a transaction to be valid, you actually see what all the input coins are, and then you check that that transaction is signed with the, the signatures that correspond to those inputs. This way you cannot forge transactions. You cannot basically pretend that some money is going out from some account to another without the secret for that account in being involved in that, in verifying, sorry, in authorizing that transaction. Okay? So authorization is key here and it is achieved through digital signatures, ECDH digital signatures. Okay? There are also some special transactions and we'll see about those in just one second. But before that, where does money live, right? I mean, so I say that there are addresses and all that stuff. So first of all, the accounts of who has how many bitcoins are always encoded in this blockchain. Every big Bitcoin client has a whole copy of this big blockchain. But everybody shares the same one and if you have the last block, you can actually just use anyone else's as well. What you need to keep in a wallet is effectively the secret associated with each uh, address. If anyone ever finds that secret, it means they can sign for that address, which means that they can transfer the money to their account, to their address, and then you lose control of that. So there are many places you could store those secrets. Okay? They're, they're called wallets. One place is your device, like your mobile phone or your computer, but then if it gets hacked, People just walk out with all your secrets and then they sign out your money to someone else. You can keep them on a server, at which point if the server gets hacked, the hackers go out with everybody's money. And that has happened quite a few times, both of these cases. Okay? So the key insight here is that if you hack someone now, either a client or a server, there is real money to be getting out of this. Real money, I mean maybe not dollars, but bitcoins. So hacking now has entered a whole new era. Okay, where actually people go for stealing money in the same way as they would, they would get into your house to take money out. Okay. Now, how do we manage the money supply? So the money supply, as the original email pointed out, is done through some hash cash. What is hash cash? Hash cash is the idea that if you want to distribute um, now, if you want to rate limit in a distributed way some activity, you make people do some work. But how do they prove efficiently that they did some work without you having to redo the work? What you do is you give them a cryptographically hard puzzle to solve that has an easy check for the solution. And such a puzzle is find the output of a hash function that has a particular bit pattern. So 10 zeros or 20 zeros somewhere at the beginning. Okay, so since a hash function is like sampling random numbers, okay, 160 bit random numbers, your probability for every hash is 2 to the minus, let's say, 20 of finding one that matches a 20 bit pattern, okay? So that will take you some time to just try different numbers until you find a hash that indeed matches, okay? So that's the original idea of Adam Back hash cache, and it was used for denial of service prevention. If you are a denial of service attacker, you, in order to get service, present one of these little hash cache tokens to prove that indeed you did some work associated with your request, and the request is only dealt with if you can prove that you did that work, not to overwhelm services. However, this hash cache idea now is actually encoded into the money supply process. What happens is the following. What are known as miners, collect transactions that are given to everybody. Transactions are broadcast to everybody, and in particular they're broadcast to all the miners. And they collect those transactions into these famous blocks. Okay, a block. Part of this blockchain. And then they add a nonce and hash and see if indeed they get lucky. If the hash has a special uh, form, it is smaller than some difficulty level hash. Okay? If, they, if it isn't, they try again with a different random number, they try again with a different random number, and with the newest transactions always added there. Okay? The difficulty of this process is 
dynamically adjusted in a collective way so that on average there is a block generated every 10 minutes. Okay? So once a block is generated, it is distributed to everybody who can immediately check that indeed it is a valid block, namely it does link to the previous known block from everybody and it actually has this invariant on its hash that shows that someone did do a lot of work to produce it. Okay? And furthermore, it actually seals the transactions. Okay? Meaning that up to that point, the transaction that you actually send to someone that says these bitcoins are transferred is not for sure. Okay? It's only once the thing has been sealed that you start getting evidence that now it is actually part of the authoritative record of events. Okay? Now there is a special transaction that the miners put in there that say, I am the miner, I generated this block and therefore please give me some coins. And this is how you generate bitcoins. Okay? By hashing, in order to seal transactions and extend the chain, you are allowed to put one more transaction in there that says, from, no, from nothing, there are now bitcoins in my pocket. Okay? And the amount that you're allowed to claim per transaction changes as the number of bitcoins in circulations change. Currently it's about 25 bitcoin per block. In 2020 it will be about 7. And in 2200, sorry, in, it will be 0. So effectively everybody by convention knows that they should not accept a block that doesn't follow how many bitcoins you know, they claim to be generated from thin air given the number of bitcoins in circulation. Okay, and th so that's just a convention in, again, the code. Okay, which means that the money supply will effectively be fixed in a few years' time. There will be no more money being generated. The total amount is, I think, 21 million bitcoins ever. So buy one now, you will be one of the few people who have one. So finally, double spending prevention. How do you avoid double spending? Okay, and remember, that the key here is that you have to broadcast every transaction to every miner. The miners have to include them in the la latest list of transactions and do this hashing to create a chain that seals that transaction into the memory of the system. So as, th as part of that, they check that whichever source addresses, um, input addresses you have put into your transaction have not already been used in the previous transaction. Why do they have incentives to do that? Because if that is the case, someone will reject that block and the network collectively will reject that block and therefore they will not be able to claim their newly generated bitcoins. Okay? Because that block will not be part of the chain. It will be thrown away. So in order for them to claim the reward of actually hashing and generating bitcoins, they need to do this integrity check that everybody else will just check to make sure that they get their reward. And that's how double spending prevention works. So, in order for you as a merchant to make sure that indeed some transaction that you're given has not been already seen, uh, so, uh, does not include money that is being double spent, you either need to have the full record of all transactions as well, but that's not sure because maybe I'm doing them at the same time in two places, but most importantly you need to wait a few blocks down the line for the transaction to be sealed in this append-only blockchain. And the current software I think considers the transaction to be confirmed after six blocks passed after it was sealed in. Okay, to make sure that not only someone has hashed and got a new coin out of this and is now in the block, but many people have actually followed and indeed this will become the longest chain that will be accepted as the authoritative record of events. Okay? So let's go into the economy, yes. Ah, yes, yes, that's a very good question. Let me get to that when I get to that. Yes. Um, I don't deal with it now, I'll deal with it in a second. Yes. So, how much is Bitcoin worth? Here is the graph. It's small, uh, sorry. This is zero, and this is like epsilon. Like, this is like $20. This is in dollars, US dollars. And in November 13, something happened. I think Cyprus went you know, belly up. And then suddenly, Bitcoin takes off. There was a previous kind of hype, and then a previous hype as well in 2011, but this really kind of 
made it and now each Bitcoin from $20 is worth about $600, a bit less than $600 last night, the high was $1,200. So if you happen to be doing scientific experiments and you bought like a couple of Bitcoins a few years ago, you've made it. Okay, you can now go and buy a car with a couple of Bitcoins. Well, I don't have expensive tastes in car. So, meanwhile, this is the number of Bitcoins in circulation. As you can see, there is a very stable curve. It's not crazy, like no one's pumping money into the system like the Mojo Nation people did. The curve follows the theoretically prescribed curve. Namely, a block is generated every 10 minutes, and indeed the feedback system does work in making sure that the difficulty is adjusted for that. Okay? And every block, depending on the amount of money in circulation currently, will generate some extra amount of bitcoins. So there is this kind of linear things with some state changes when indeed the, the, the steepness of the curve changes, and it will eventually go to zero. And how bitcoin works after that is a very interesting question. And this is the size of the Bitcoin economy. Uh, this was like a little bubble, but the little bubble made the economy a few worth, worth a few million dollars. Nowadays, it, it seems pathetic, even as a bubble. At the time, it seemed very big. However, at its height, this was $14 billion worth. Okay? Of course, with Bitcoin losing its value, now it's about $6 billion worth. So it's a big economy. It used to be very small, now it's big-ish. It's not as big as the US but it's not insignificant anymore. So other key numbers. There are 60,000 transactions per day. If we exclude casinos and stuff like that, I have many very small transactions. Uh, every day, in terms of value in dollars, we have 50 to 150 million dollars being traded. So there is a little bit of liquidity going around. It's not just that everybody puts their money and forgets them. However, in terms of system expense, the mining process is estimated to be 22 million and some giga hashes a second. Okay? So this is massive. This is probably the biggest distributed computation we're doing so far, and it is useless. Okay? Its only use is to maintain the Bitcoin properties. There is no other use for this. However, the social cost of this is enormous. Okay? Rival, uh, Rival, which is a company that builds special hardware for mining, for hashing effectively, to, to create blockchains, estimates that per giga hash a second, uh, some specialized equipment co costs $40. In December 2013, last December, Six million giga hashes were added to the network above what was available before. So that is just people buying $240 million in equipment to hash. Okay? This is just the capital cost. I'm not even counting the electricity and the networking costs on top of that. Okay? So this is an extremely inefficient way of actually achieving what in a centralized way is achieved very straightforwardly, namely having a ledger that is in high integrity. Okay? However, the advantage of this is that it's totally decentralized. Namely, there is no place you can go to and put someone in jail or tell them delete that transaction. And that's the key. Okay? Whoever has the most hashing power says what is in the blockchain, because they are the ones with higher probability to get the blocks in. Okay? And the idea is that there can be no entity that controls the majority of that, or even a small fraction of that, because everybody is free to just go in and chip in. Okay? Now, that does not mean that the US, for example, cannot regulate that the whole system is illegal and that the code should change so that only the hashes of the treasury, the hashes of the treasury count double, or whatever, you know, something crazy. But this is a hard thing to do because, of course, no one outside the U.S. is obliged to recognize this. So we just go for a split of the currency rather than actually changing what Bitcoin does. Now, how secure, though, is this distributed consensus is a good question. And remember that it is not a race with a winner. It is not that if you can hash more than everybody else, you always get your block in. It is like a lottery. The more hashes you, you can produce, the higher the probability you have of actually having your block accepted. Okay? 
Therefore, even if you have 1% of the hashing power in your hand with 1% probability, it is your block that will be added to the chain. Okay? Which means that with 1% probability, you can actually drop transactions or fake transactions. Well, you cannot really easily fake transactions because there are the signatures, but you can definitely drop transactions. Okay? And that's not very good, and this is why you have to usually wait six blocks for transactions to really be confirmed, okay? Because otherwise, you could actually generate, if you have significant amounts of computing power, you could generate two blocks that compete with each other, one that tells one merchant that you know, the money goes to them, and one that tells the other merchant the money goes to them, with probability one in 100, if you, you know, probability one in 10,000, which might be still worth it, okay? So it is not out of the realm of the possibility that some blocks are going to be bad, but it is out of the realm of the possibility that the longest chain is bad because the probability of you getting your block in and being able to maintain the illusion of correctness and the inconsistency over time is astronomically small, even if you have a significant fraction of the network. Now, is Bitcoin really anonymous is an interesting question. The answer is no, because money comes into exchanges, becomes bitcoins, or is generated, becomes bitcoins, and then has to be transferred in a way that you can follow the links from input addresses to output addresses across the network and then be taken out again as money, okay? Researchers have been following those links and effectively de-anonymizing transactions. Okay, so this idea that was originally presented that bitcoin is this anonymous coin is not actually true. And we have many cases of this. So uh, researchers at UCSD wrote this very fun paper, A Fistful of Bitcoins. And they have many cases where they basically follow thefts of bitcoins and trace them to the points where they were actually exfiltrated as real dollars after that out of the network. In fact, they, they also discuss one case, that's case study three, where they couldn't really do that. But the reason for that is because the actual thief themselves realize that it's very difficult to do that. And out of the 3,250 something Bitcoins they stole, 2,800 are still actually in the network. They have not managed to get them out in a way that is transparent. So it's actually very hard to move out of Bitcoin a lot of money and buy a Mercedes with it, okay, in a way that you're not traceable. Because it's only a pseudonymous system, not an anonymous system. And pseudonymity means that as soon as your pseudonym is linked with a real world identity anywhere, okay, then you can trace back and forth and find out what everything else is that is associated with you. Okay? So now this idea that, oh my God, Bitcoin is uh, anonymous, it's the end of the world, is going away. Okay? In fact, places such as the Silk Road, which so stole drugs, had to themselves run an anonymizer within the service to make sure that you cannot trace what drugs everybody is buying. So you would pay Silk Road and Silk Road would pay the actual merchants, well, the drug dealers, um, <laughs> I guess so, um, in a way that you cannot link who's paying in and what that money is going out for. So they were acting as an anonymizing mix in the middle. So how to make Bitcoin anonymous is an interesting research problem and there is a particular proposal called Zero Coin. Please go and read about it. It's, it's fun and it indeed now combines Bitcoin as a backing currency and electronic e-cash as a payment mechanism. As I said, electronic e-cash is something we know how to do pretty well. So they adapt those ideas to Bitcoin and allow you to indeed have now anonymous, truly anonymous coins backed by e-coin. Whether that's a good idea or not is an interesting discussion. Then there were also recent problems about transaction malleability that allowed people to claim, and I'm going to go very quickly through that, that some Bitcoin transactions that they asked an exchange to do did not go through and the exchange was doing them again as a result. And therefore, these good people's accomplices were paid twice. Bitcoin exchanges had to close down for the last week. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention. Okay? And this is one of the reasons that caused the, the crash from like 1,000 to... 600. So this, this thing is a little bit stressful, right? I mean, if you're putting your savings in there and then something like that happens and then the, the, your savings lose half their value, it's not maybe quite ready for prime time. So just to, to conclude now, Bitcoin as a currency has to solve all the big problems we described so far that a currency has to solve, right? 
So who has control of the money supply? By convention, basically it follows this well understood curve of people mining and at some rate getting money. So no one does, the software does, and the software is well understood what it should do. Uh, it will max out eventually, 21 million is uh, the maximum. Who gets the new money? The miners get the new money by doing proof of work. It's a very well understood process and how much they get is also very well understood. How do we make sure we remember? There is this peer-to-peer -peer system, okay? And who starts with the money is something we didn't discuss. Mr. Sasha starts with the money, okay? So he was the one who basically could hash the easiest coins to start with and as a result, in today's values, he would nearly be a billionaire. He was a billionaire a few months ago, okay? So that's pretty cool. Now, I, I realize I did not actually address your question. What happens when mining does not give you any more money? Remember, in a transaction, there is money coming in, money coming out. If there is any difference, that change goes to the miner. And after basically the miners have no incentives to mine anymore because they cannot anymore get just from the mining a new coin, they will only accept to include in their blocks and their will seal transactions in, um, transactions that leave enough change. So they will say, I will only hash in transactions with 0.002 bitcoins left for me. And that they can basically claim for themselves. That's the idea. Exactly. Exactly, but you know, they will not seal in transactions. So the idea is that the miners will always try to cover their costs and 5% more or something like that to make a profit. Okay, good, so there is some philosophy, but the important thing is what is the future of these currencies? So first of all, and this is to conclude, it is impossible that these things will not be looked at by regulators, okay? The US has already uh, indicated that it is a Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction. It's not going to go after Bitcoin in the same way as e-gold, partly because there is, it's very difficult to actually go after Bitcoin, okay? China, not so much. China has said, if your money's in Bitcoin, you're on your own. You're in a state of wilderness. Uh, we know what our currency is. It's not Bitcoin. Good luck to you. We will maybe even put you in trouble down the line. We, you know, we don't know. Uh, so the question is, of course, what options do regulators have to actually regulate, right? Because the mechanics of how Bitcoin works makes it on purpose quite hard to regulate by saying it's illegal. So other things will have to be done. But to some extent, this is what economics is about. If the central bank in the U.S. decides to buy all the Bitcoins tomorrow, they can. and They can just destroy them and be done with it. Some people will be very rich. But, you know, it can be done. It will not be done maybe through legislation only. The second thing is that because now we have bitcoins as a backing currency, and this is indeed a currency, and it's a very modern currency in that it is actually digital, we probably will see a huge innovation in terms of payment mechanisms. Today, if you wanted to innovate as a payment mechanism like Steve did, in order to you know, have some devices that help you or some wallets or some services, that, or financial services, you need to be in bed with some bank. Banks are mammoths, okay? They're in the business of making billions and billions. They're not that interested in your idea unless it is going to make them billions and millions. Your idea probably will not make them billions of billions as far as they're concerned. Maybe it will, but probably it won't. So they're not interested. So innovation is actually really hard. Whereas with Bitcoin, you don't need to deal with a bank, okay? You basically take the, the software and make a service and it's backed in Bitcoins. And if only people believe that this currency is worth anything, you're good to go, okay? So innovation cycles will go very fast, but that does not spell the demise of traditional currencies. I believe that it is much more likely that we will see that the traditional currencies will actually have a digital backing rather than that Bitcoin will take over the euro and the pound and be the currency of the world, okay? Maybe actually national uh, and central banks will realize that actually in the 21st century what we need is currencies that allow you to in fact do digital things with them. And that's just a different form but of the samely regulated currency. And finally, the question is, is there a room for more than one currency? Bitcoin really benefited from the economic crisis that hit Cyprus and generally, you know, the confusion there. And it really benefited from a super vibrant gambling and drugs market, okay? Like if you wanted drugs in the last two years, you know, this was the, the place to go a year ago.
Okay, you went to Silk Road. You didn't mess around with going around finding dealers in shady areas, right? Same thing if you want, if you're in the US and you want to play in a casino or poker or whatever, Bitcoin is it. Okay? And it's not really clear what will bootstrap. And remember that you need something maybe to bootstrap currencies, and these two things really bootstrapped the, the need for Bitcoin. It's not really clear what other need there are that Bitcoin doesn't cover um, to have other currencies like Litecoin or Dogecoin or whatever. The, everybody else wants to make their own currency because, of course, they want to be the first ones to start getting the money if it goes up to be rich. Okay? But it's not really clear there is a room for that, economically speaking. There have to be some clear benefits, and it's not clear what these will be. And then, of course, the, the, the societal challenge is, is there really a possibility to have a zero governance currency? Because that's what Bitcoin is. There is some governance that is encoded in the code and set forever, and that's it. And is that actually possible? Like, how is it going to react to crisis? How is it going to react to market behaviors that need to be regulated traditionally? We don't know. OK, cool. So that's the, the talk. Thank you very much. And I have one question. After all this, who would buy a Bitcoin today? No one would buy a Bitcoin. OK, well, let me ask another question. I mean, a Bitcoin is a big thing. It costs $800. Who would put $10 in a fraction of a Bitcoin? OK? Who would put $100? OK. Who would put 800 for a whole Bitcoin? OK, cool. Thank you very much. That's good to know how convincing it is. <laughs>